Hi, thanks for joining us for today's message from Calvary in Lake Havasu City, Arizona. Today's message is about becoming the children of God from the book of Galatians chapters 3 and 4. If you want to follow along with the life notes, download them now from calvaryaz.com forward slash life notes. Now, here is Pastor Chad Garrison. I'm going to invite you to take a seat and grab your Bible or your Bible app and turn to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians 3 is our text. We're actually going to be in chapters 3 and 4. And uh, if you are in the room at either of our campuses and you don't have a Bible, uh, that's fine. Grab one of the Bibles in the seats uh, right around you and turn to page 1,156. And I love saying that because our Parker campus, this is the first time I've, I've gotten to say to you that you just grab a Bible in the seat around you and turn to page 1156. And I love that. So uh, glad, I'm excited. I've gotten to be in your uh, new building, and it's beautiful and wonderful, and glad you guys are filling it up. So uh, that is a beautiful thing. Hey, by the way, if you're in any of our campuses and you don't have a Bible and you want one, take one. It is our gift to you. We want you to have God's Word and read God's Word. Uh, and uh, if you're joining us online and you don't have a Bible and you want one, then uh, just ask us for one. We'll get you one because we know if you read and apply God's Word, God will change your life. Hey, would you prefer to live in slavery or freedom? Yeah, I mean, we all know it's an obvious choice, right? But at the same time, we often choose slavery over freedom in our lives. Um, our enemy, we're talking about Satan, is um, the best salesman ever. Okay, I mean, uh, Jesus called him the father of lies. And, and uh, you know, so he, he knows how to sell the things that we don't want or need, which is what all sales is, right? You know, <laughs> it's like, you don't need this, but here, buy it anyway. So, I mean, he, so... Satan packages slavery in incredibly appealing ways. I mean, and just look around and you see that our culture is buying it, whether it's the, you know, oh, you're going to have the freedom of partying or, or uh, you're going to enjoy the, the secret shame of porn or, hey, you just get caught up in your own success or make a lot of money or just be a, a strict adherent to religion. Uh, he's a great salesman and we all often fall for his lies but we were created by God to live as his children, and that includes living in freedom. Now, our problem is we are imprisoned by the law. Galatians chapter 3, I want to pick up in verse 21, and uh, the Apostle Paul says, is the law then contrary to the promises of God? Certainly not. For if a law had been given that could give life, then righteousness would indeed be by the law. But the scripture imprisoned everything under sin so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Now before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. Okay, uh, look. Mankind, people, have been imprisoned by sin since Adam and Eve made the decision to rebel in paradise. And we can blame it on our ancestors, but we followed in their footsteps, every single one of us. And, uh, and, and the law was given through Moses to the people of Israel so that God could explain our captivity, so that we could understand the bondage that we were living in so that we could understand God's righteousness, God's holiness, God's expectation, and he could give us those, those guidelines, the, the rules to live by, the Ten Commandments and, and all those others, so that we could understand where the danger lied, and then we could try to live by it, but we couldn't live by it. No matter how hard we tried, we couldn't keep the law, and we became aware that we were lawbreakers. Now, because we're all good at religion and we all like to feel good about ourselves, the Pharisees and, and other religious people, but specifically the Pharisees of Jesus' day, had decided that they were capable of keeping the law. They're like, oh no, we keep the law. We're, we keep the letter of the law. We do all these things and we're good people. We're righteous. And so Jesus said, you don't really understand all of the, what it means. 
He says, you know, you think, oh, because I haven't physically killed somebody, you're not guilty of murder, he said. But uh, he kind of expanded the application of what it means, do not murder, to include hatred and anger poured out on people. And then Jesus said, you know, you think that you're pure because you haven't actually slept with another man's wife, but I'm just telling you, if you even think about it, you're guilty of it. Uh, You guys know what that means, right? We're all guilty. Okay, I mean, every one of us at some point in time has been angry enough that we were filled with hatred towards somebody. We're guilty of murder. I mean, look, if, if you want to stand here and defend that you've never had an impure thought, um, we, have a, we have a program for you on Monday nights at 6.30 called Celebrate Recovery because you are deep in denial, Okay. I mean, it's just, it's reality. It's, it's who we are. And, and he goes on to expand others, you know. If, and so if we're living by the law, or really, if we're just alive, then we are prisoners of sin. Okay, and, and the truth of Scripture made us aware of that, which is why Paul says we're living in prison by sin. Not, not because we wanted to, but because that's our reality, so whether you sin a lot or you sin a little, you're still a prisoner of sin. Sounds awful, and it is. But the good news, the gospel is, we become children of God by faith in Jesus. Let's keep reading, okay? I'm gonna pick up verse 23 again because I just love what it says. Now, before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. Verse 24 So then the law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian for in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is no male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus." And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. Did did you catch those statements? Verse 24, we are justified by faith. Verse 26, you are now sons of God through, what is it? Through faith. Yeah, it's not by keeping the law, it's through faith. He says, this is who you are. Verse 29, he says, Abraham's offspring, your heirs, according to the promise given to Abraham. So, by the way, let me just point out, he uses the word sons, and, uh, you know, and as our language has evolved, some people want to put in children. Can't we just be children of God? And they kept the word sons in there because sons has a meaning that, that we don't capture, okay? In that day and time, guess who inherited the property? Sons, yeah, sorry, sorry, ladies. You, you know, they didn't. I didn't care. You could be, you could be inherited. So, um, uh, you know, the, so he, he says, look, if you believe in Jesus, then you qualify as a son. And he uses the word as an heir with Christ. In other words, you have the full rights and responsibilities of being part of the family of God, no matter if you are male or female, no matter if you are Jew or Greek. That's huge right there. Because a, a Jewish guy who was a Pharisee is writing that, inspired by God. No matter what your ethnicity is, no matter what your background is, no matter what your status is, slave or free. I mean, the whole world at that time was divided into slave and free. And free people had rights and slaves didn't. And, and it, was, it was huge. And Paul says, all that is wiped away in Christ Jesus. And now you are all sons of God, equal children of God in his presence, in his eyes. Amen. I mean, that is huge. But, but we don't get there. <laughs> we don't get there by being good people or good neighbors or good patriots. Okay? We don't get to heaven by being good people, good neighbors, or good patriots. We can't get to heaven by being religiously faithful adherents, by attending church, tithing, serving, praying, or bang. That's the path of the law. And it doesn't matter how well you live it out, you still fail. See, we get to heaven by faith in Jesus Christ. Okay, Paul is so clear in this, writing about this whole battle between the law and works and faith and, and all that. And he says, look, 
But you get to heaven by believing that Jesus is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world that died on the cross to pay for your sins, that was raised from the dead, and you make a commitment to follow him and claim him as your Lord, as your master, as your king, as the one that you attach your allegiance to. And, and that is how you become a son of God. That is what makes us children of God. And, and look, it doesn't matter if you're a good person or a bad person. It doesn't matter if you're a religious person or if you never went to church and this is the first time you've been in church in years. It doesn't matter your background, your failures, your accomplishments, your success, your status, or your wealth. The only thing that matters is simply this. Do you believe in Jesus? I love you guys talking back. All right, I hope Parker's talking back too. Do you guys believe in Jesus? Yes. All right, so they're still answering here in Havasu. So, hey, um, the, uh, if you've invited Jesus to change your life, you know that Jesus has given you eternal life. And if you don't know that, and you're in this room, or you're joining us online, or you're at our Parker campus, you don't know that Jesus has changed your life. You've never made that commitment to follow him. Maybe you've been trying to be a good person. Maybe you've been trying to turn over a new leaf. Maybe you've been wanting to try and be good enough, and you can't get there. We want you to just confess Jesus as Savior. I mean, the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 10 said, if we confess with our mouth Jesus is Lord, and we believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. And we would love for you to enter into that life-changing relationship with Jesus and let him set you free from your sins and change your life. And if you want to talk with someone about that, uh, we would love to have that conversation. At the end of the service, whatever service you're in, there's a prayer team at the front, and they would love to pray with you, talk with you. There are connect cards in the seats. We would love for you to fill one of those out. We will talk, we'll give you a call this week. There's pastors in the foyer. If you're joining us online, you can talk to our service host, or you can message us. We will respond to you in the same way. We want to have that conversation because we want to lead you to that life-changing relationship with the Son of God and Savior of the world. So now, if you know that you have made a decision uh, and, and that Jesus is your Savior, if you know that you're in that place, then uh, understand this. As a follower of Christ, we will live as slaves or we will live as sons. We will live as slaves or we will live as sons. Uh, continuing the thought, in chapter 4, verse 1, Paul says, uh, I mean that the heir, because remember, we're, we're heirs according to the promise. I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave, though he's the owner of everything. But he is under guardians and managers until the date set by his father. In the same way, we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman. That's appropriate for Mother's Day weekend, isn't it? Born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. I mean, these are, these are just really cool verses. I hope you just kind of bask in those. I know I tried to explain them through that interpretation that, uh, that I read, but Here's the thing. If Jesus is your Savior, then you are a son of God. Uh, but as a son, you're free, and in that freedom, you can choose to continue living as a slave. Now, it doesn't make any sense that we would do that, does it? I mean, we already said, would you rather live in freedom or in slavery? And you guys all said freedom. But at the same time, let's just be honest, we all make bad decisions, don't we? Okay? I mean, there's not one of us that can go, I've never made a bad decision. Because all we'd have to do is ask, to ask your family and friends, and they, can, they have a list, okay? Um, and so I just want to offer three comparisons, three contrasts to help you determine if you're living as a son or a slave, okay? And, and, and this isn't for anyone else to decide for you. This is for you to look at your life, your heart, and kind of go, what defines me? Am, am I living in the freedom of a son, or am I living in the... In the you know, imprisonment as a slave. Uh, first one, the comparison contrast is faith or works. Faith or works. Sons live by faith. Slaves live by works. And when I say works, I'm talking about religious deeds, good deeds. Faith believes the promises of God and lives in them. Promises like we are forgiven by God's grace. 
which means we no longer need to be imprisoned in guilt and shame. And if guilt and shame are driving you and, you know, have place in your life to control you, then that's a tell. Because, you know, when you believe that you are completely forgiven by God's grace through the sacrifice of Jesus, you know all your sins are forgiven, and that means all of them. You believe, faith believes the promises of God like God will never leave us or forsake us, which gives us courage and confidence to live not being held captive by fear and anxiety. And I know our, our society is rampant with fear and anxiety. And, and uh, look, if you're on anxiety meds, I'm not telling you to stop taking them, okay? Uh, because there's neurological, physiological reasons and, and that stuff too. But what I'm saying is what dominates your life? It, 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 are you captive to those fears or are you living courageously in Christ as he has set you free? It's a tell. Uh, faith believes the promises that God can use anyone as opposed to that lie of Satan that says, oh no, you're disqualified, you're not good enough, look at your past, look what you've done. God could never forgive you for that. And if he could forgive you, he would never allow you on stage. Right? <laughs> He would never allow you to have someplace. Other. And that, that is, that, look, that is so false, by the way, because none of us are worthy enough to be up here. None of us are worthy enough to teach the word of God. None of us are worthy enough to lead other people to Christ. We are all, we've already established that we're all sinners. So, and we're not going to play those games and we're not going to pretend that, you know, some of us are better than others because we're all evil and destined for hell except for the grace of God. And, and, but, but Satan wants to tell you, oh, you can't do that. You're not, you don't deserve that. Well, you don't. You deserve hell. I deserve hell. But uh, we don't get that. So faith believes God can use anyone. Faith believes we have eternal life. And so there's no fear of circumstances. That, yes, we grieve in the, in the throes of death, but we live differently because we know that the best is yet to come. Um, but if you're workspace, if you're living as a slave, then you feel like you're never good enough. You're never good enough. Ah, oh, I failed again. Look, I, I did that again. You, you kind of feel like if you're living as a slave, we're singing these songs about God's grace and his mercy and his love and all this kind of wonderful stuff, and yet you're sitting there feeling like, well, God loves everyone, but he tolerates me. Right? I, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but I know that some of us feel that way. We feel like God loves everyone, but he just tolerates me because I'm wicked, I'm evil, I fail him again and again and again and again. See, that's, that's Satan talking about making us slaves. We don't have to live that way. Um, you know, slavery tells us that God can't use screw-ups like me. Slavery tells us things like, well, I hope I get to heaven. Can I just tell you this, that, that God wants you to have a certainty that you're going to heaven because you know that Jesus is your Savior. You know he's forgiven your sins. You know that he's purchased you from hell with his blood and your destiny is sealed and you're guaranteed salvation because the Holy Spirit is in you and he's the one guaranteeing it, not your, you know, worthless self, okay? I mean, because I can't guarantee me anything. I'm not good enough to do that. But the Holy Spirit says, no, you're mine and I'm taking you there whether you want to go or not and I want to go. Okay, and, and so this is, you know, that's, that's that thing. But, but slavery, it, it's kind of that place of, I, I hope I get there. I hope I win the lottery. Uh, but I'm not counting on it. I'm going to heaven because Jesus has said so. And I am counting on that. Um, and that's, that's the difference. I, I don't want us to have this fear-influenced future that plagues us and causes us to live in prison. Sons live by faith. Slaves live by fear. Which one is dominating your inner life? And then the other contrast, second contra contrast is freedom or rules. Sons live in freedom. Slaves follow rules. And, and again, they follow rules religiously because they feel like they have to. After all, slaves have to follow the rules. They're, they're slaves, right? And, and look, God gave us commands. He gave us rules uh, and he gave us rules as guidelines on how to live our life and stay out of the ditches of life, how to prevent tragedies and that kind of stuff. But he gave us those rules to teach us about his holiness and to show us our sin so that we would call on Jesus. Slaves try to live by the rules. And by the way, the rules bless. If you follow the rules, your life is going to be blessed. 
But living by the rules without grace turns us into joyless, judgmental hypocrites. Or it, you know, if you're living as a slave, you just go, I can't keep the rules. I give up trying. I'm going to go back to the slavery of sin. Uh, sons, though, live in freedom. Not a freedom that flaunts the rules, but a freedom that is inspired by God's love for us. You see, when we surrender to the leadership of Jesus, he sets us free to love, serve, and bless in his name. Let me say that again. When we surrender to Jesus, freedom is found in surrendering to Jesus. Now, this doesn't make any sense. It's kind of one of those spiritual oxymorons because we read it and go, I want to be free, and we go, okay, then surrender. Okay, if I surrender, I'm not free, except that Jesus will make you free if you surrender. If you don't surrender, you're going to live in slavery to sin. Congratulations, your life is going to be frustrating. But if you surrender, he's going to set you free. And you go, okay, I don't understand it. Don't worry about it. Just surrender, okay? <laughs> if you don't get it, then, then step into surrender and trust Jesus to lead your life because he will set you free. You know, Jesus said it over and over again. If the son sets you free, you're free indeed. How do you get set free? By surrendering. By giving up your freedom, Jesus sets you free. Okay, that, I mean, but sons trust him to do that. And so they go, hey, you know what? I'm gonna surrender to Jesus. And then Jesus sets us free to love in a way that we can't love uh, if we're not surrendered. It, to serve with joy and to bless people in his name. By the way, that's why the Apostle Paul in chapter five of this same letter, we'll get there, wrote the fruit of the spirit controlled life is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such as these, there is no law. Amen. There is no law. He goes, look, if you're living a spirit-controlled life, don't worry about the rules because you're keeping them. Yeah. You're not trying to keep them. It's happening in your life because you're letting the Spirit guide your life and you're living out the character of Jesus and it changes everything that you do so that you go, oh yeah, I know the rules and I'm honoring the rules, but I'm not living by the rules. Because the Holy Spirit is dominating my life and he's building in the Christ character in me. So rules are there and, and we don't dishonor them, but they don't dominate us. So what dominates your faith life? Freedom or rules? Because sons live in freedom, slaves live by rules. And finally, uh, the last tell or last contrast is abundance or scarcity. Abundance or scarcity. Uh, I, I mentioned this because you know, verse 29 said, if you're Christ, then you're Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. Verse 7 of chapter 4, so you are no longer a slave, but a son, and if a son, then an heir through God. Slaves don't own anything, so they operate out of a scarcity mindset. There is never enough, so we have to hold on to it. It's a, it's a selfish, fearful approach to life. Sons live with an abundance mindset because God will always provide what we need, what is necessary to accomplish his mission through his people. After all, we are heirs of God's kingdom. Think about that. You're a follower of Jesus. You're an heir of the kingdom, which means, guys, we get everything. I mean, everything belongs. All authority on heaven and earth has been given to Jesus. So he's got everything. We're joint heirs with Jesus. We're on, we're on the list. We, we inherit it all. We are not impoverished, like just, oh, I hope that God can provide enough. For no, it, the, the, you know, let me just illustrate. I grew up in churches with scarcity mindsets. Okay, I know it's a judgmental statement, but I'm just looking back and going, oh, yeah. Uh, one of the points was benevolence. You know, every time we celebrate communion, we take up a benevolence offering, we give money away. And, uh, and I love the way Calvary gives money away, but... Uh, but I grew up in churches where we had benevolence. We took up that same benevolence offering. We just never gave anybody any money. I mean, it's just, you know, God was around church. My dad was a deacon. I was, you know, and, and the conversation was like this. Well, we, they need some help. Well, how do we know what they're going to do with the money? How do we know they're going to spend it for what we give it to them? How do we know? We can't trust them. What if they misuse it? Then what are, are we culpable? Are we get, and so very little assistant was given. If it was given, there was strings all over the place. And people just were like, oh, okay. I don't feel very loved here with that. I, I love the fact that, you know, three times a year, four times a year, we give away gift cards. And people would just walk up and take a gift card. 
don't know if you guys realize, but we give away about $30,000 a year. Just in, in, anybody who needs it can have it, okay? You guys do that. And, and uh, when we started doing that, people go, can we write on the gift cards, no alcohol or tobacco? And I go, why? So they can just sell them if they're going to do that? Don't worry about it. Look, don't worry about it. It'll just, just bless people in Jesus' name, that, and, and that's going to bless people. And then we, you know, total, uh, every year, we give away about $100,000 in benevolence help in our communities of Parker and Havasu because people need it, and you guys are generous, and we give it to them. Yeah. Okay, that's, that's just the difference between abundance and scarcity. It's like, we give it away, and you guys keep giving it to us. We have to give more of it away, and it's like, okay, we'll do it. I mean, uh, you know, and I grew up in, you know, in those same churches. You know, there's that whole, and this, is, this one hits a little bit closer at home, but the compensation for pastors and church staff was always out of a scarcity mindset. And uh, by the way, I don't set my own pay, so just uh, don't worry about that. But, but it was always kind of this deal, and people, I heard people say this in leadership at multiple churches. God, you keep them humble, we'll keep them poor. Yeah, they say that out loud, proudly, about how they're going to pay their pastors and, and their staff. And, and it's just a scarcity mindset. Um, okay, more recently, uh, you know, this is, this is about the Parker campus launch. Uh, so, you know, we had been planning the Parker campus launch for about a year. We had people in Parker who were asking us to come down and do a campus there. And we're like, yeah, we, you know, I, I just had the conviction. Every time I drove through Parker on my way to Phoenix or back, I was like, we need to have a campus here. We just, we just need to do that. And, uh, and so we're, we started planning on it five and a half years ago. We're ready to launch the campus. And uh, just before we were getting ready to launch, I was visited by a pastor from Parker uh, who was upset that we were putting a campus in Parker. And, uh, and he kind of said, you know, hey, uh, you're, you're just coming down to steal our sheep. And I, and I said, no, we're interested in the 5,000 unchurched sheep that are in the Parker area. And uh, we still are. And, and then, uh, you know, this man of God said something that uh, I was actually stunned by. He said, well, you know, there's only so many pieces of the pie to go around. And you're, you're just going to infringe on that. that actually, he said pizza, you know, which is my language. Uh, he says, there's only so many pieces of pizza to go around, and, and you're going you're gonna to cut into those pieces. And, uh, and I was stunned, and I just, before I could even think about it, I just said, it's a good thing we know the pizza maker. Um, because I recognize the scarcity mindset. Look, can I, can I just tell you something? God is not running out. Okay, he's, he's, not, he's God. He's not running out. He's not running out of blessings, no matter how many he gives out. He's not running out of resources, no matter how much uh, we need. He's not running out of servants, no matter how challenging the tasks. And he's not running out of grace, no matter how desperate the sinner. Okay, he has enough for you, whatever your need is. Uh, so don't live in that place of fear and of scarcity and thinking that's not enough and I've got to hoard what I have and I've got to hang on to it. No, that's why Jesus tells us to give it away. You know, to, to just go ahead and practice that generosity and practice the, the trusting of God and give your time and your energy and let God meet you there. But this is a tell. Are we living by abundance or scarcity? Are we living as sons or slaves? You see, we are sons of God by faith in Jesus. Let's live in faith, in freedom, and abundance. Will you pray with me? God, we love you. It's amazing how you love us. It is amazing how you bless us. It is amazing that you look on us with compassion and kindness when we are such rebellious dimwits. And yet you do. And you pursue us and you call us to follow you and you give us words of wisdom and invite us to read it and your spirit living in us teaches us the truth of God's word and teaches us how to apply it. But God, we wanna do better. We wanna live as sons. We wanna live in your promises by faith, uh, in freedom and in abundance. And so God, uh, we ask that you would teach us. And our commitment is we're gonna live free because you died to set us free. And we're going to honor Jesus in our words and our deeds and the choices that we make because um, you've given us a mission 
and it's to lead this world to a life-changing relationship with the Son of God who loved us and gave himself up for us. So God, we trust you. Help us to trust you more. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Although we are imprisoned by the law, we become children of God by faith in Jesus. Galatians 4, 7 says, So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. If today's message spoke to you and you'd like to support the ministry of Calvary, you can visit our website, calvaryaz.com. The homepage has links to contact us, to give, listen to past sermons, links to our social media accounts, and to subscribe to our daily devotionals known as Your Word for the Day. Well, that'll do it for now. Please come back and join us next weekend. Bye-bye.